Welcome to the State of Mind Virtual Speaker Series. This series has been developed to provide education and support to youth, caregivers, and educators during this challenging time. This series is a collaboration between two local nonprofits, One in Five and MindPeace, and various community mental health partners. We're glad you're here to educate yourself and to learn how to keep your brain in a healthy state of mind. I would like to welcome everyone to the State of Mind um, speaker series. State of Mind speaker series is presented by a partnership between One in Five and Mind Peace. And we are just thrilled today to be talking about grief and loss, what to do when we're all missing out, uh, managing grief and loss during COVID-19. Um, this is geared specifically to students and youth but we think that um, anyone, educators and parents alike, will find this discussion really interesting. And I'm just thrilled and grateful to introduce um, our two presenters tonight. Um, I'm gonna, I practiced their names before I, what I, we started, so hopefully I'll get it right. Um, Anne-Marie um, Kawadi Bogan, and she is an independently licensed social worker and um, a child and family therapist. She's worked in the community for quite a long time and is a bereavement specialist with Companions on a Journey. And then I'd also like to introduce to you Sheila Mon Monifo uh, Canoza. How did I do? Did I get that okay, Sheila? <laughs> Sheila is the um, founder and director, um, executive director of Companions on a Journey Grief Support. Um, she is a bereavement specialist, lecturer, educator, facilitator and a nationally published writer. So we are just thrilled to have you both with us today and grateful that you are here to share your expertise and wisdom with, with us. And so I will pass it on to you all. Thank you, Chris. Um, today we'd like to talk to you about grief and maybe some of the things that you have been going through um, first when we first uh, shut down, the schools all shut down, and then talk about what you may be going through today. Um, it's a little different now, but there are still a lot of grief and loss issues that you're dealing with, uh, and we would like to be able to discuss them with you and uh, help you find some coping skills uh, if you are struggling with some areas of depression or anxiety, um, anger, fear. Um, we're, we're here to kind of help you navigate through that. So the first thing we'd like to do is to talk about what you've been through for the last five months. Um, there were so many things that happened, the fear about COVID and everything uh, that we had to do to kind of keep ourselves safe from a health perspective, but we really didn't have time to prepare ourselves for what was happening to us from a mental health perspective. Um, there were so many things that went on for kids when uh, school shut down. We had to learn how to navigate online learning. Uh, we had to uh, isolate from our friends and some of our family. And I'm sure that was very difficult because those are often our strongest support systems. Um, we were housebound. And it's really hard to be housebound when you're a teenager. Uh, so we uh, often encourage you to go out into the, the, at least the backyard and put your feet in the grass, but we'll talk more about that. Um, there were other concerns about maybe family members who were going out to work uh, and how safe they were physically. Um, there were maybe some financial concerns that were going on for you. Um, you just may have been um, experiencing some loss issues because you didn't get to do your sports or you didn't get to graduate the way we normally graduate um, or have some other special event. Maybe your birthday was compromised. I know that I had to spend my birthday with my family um, only and that was a big change for me. So there were a lot of things that went on for you. Um, one of the things that we'd like to talk about is what it looks like um, when you are dealing with grief from loss and change versus grief from death. Um, so Sheila, would you like to start that? Yes, so grief really, it doesn't just come from death. It, it's, it's from death, but it's also from loss and change. And we are finding right now during this pandemic, 
um, that a lot of people, while we're grieving the death of a loved one, our normal ways to grieve, we cannot do that. And then in our normal surroundings, we have lost being able to share with others and have them embrace us and comfort us and be able to share with them. Um, we had to navigate through a whole new way of being able to do that. And so when we try to create a balance in grief, um, it takes time, you know, and I think it's important for us to be able to name some of the things that we've gone through. We often, and I'm using a slinky with a broken arm right now, um, but we typically, we give a slinky to everybody because in grief, um, and in life, none of us are ever completely balanced. We try to be completely balanced, but we're not able to all the time. And that's okay, because grief is unique. Grief takes time, and it affects our bodies and our minds in ways that we never thought possible before. And it's trying to create a new reality. And when we're talking about our grief, sometimes we build the protective walls. Um, and protective walls are good to build. You know, sometimes we need time to just kind of cocoon ourselves to allow our hearts to heal. And a lot of times in, in grief, we can feel like we have a hole in our heart. And, and it can feel like somebody's really pulled it out. And out of, that, out of that hole, I say, if you think about that with your heart, think about your heart being a container of love. And when we miss someone and we miss the things that we're used to, sometimes feelings and emotions can come out. There can be tears, there can be anguish and despair, there can be all kinds of things. And you can feel like you're bottoming out. And a lot of times when we're bottoming out, we spring back up. But what happens when we don't spring back up? You know, it's the people, places, and things um, that we have in our lives that will help us. So it's important to identify those people that can support you, that you can talk to, to identify the places that bring you peace. And Anne-Marie, when you said, you know, going outside and putting your feet in the grass, um, the, the Anne-Marie shared with me that I needed to do that during COVID-19. And I did do that. And oh my gosh, it really felt well. Um, and the things, it could be having an ice cream cone, it could be making chocolate chip cookies, um, it can be watching butterflies, just different things that you can find um, to help us in life to create a new balance. So some of the thing, other things that we are going through right now is maybe some anxiety about what the future holds. For so many students, they are um, doing virtual online work and that that is difficult it's difficult because we tend not to have structure when we're in our homes all day um, so maybe your eating habits aren't the best that they could have been or they are um, what maybe you are not on a schedule like you need to be um, so one of the things that we are encouraging you to do is to look at your routine um, and your schedule and to try to get yourself back onto that routine um, as if you were going to school. So waking up around the same time and having breakfast and then going to your computer and doing your homework. Um, and then maybe spending that extra time that you have doing something fun that you didn't normally, you know, you wouldn't have a chance to do in uh, a regular school day. Uh, I know that I painted the upstairs of my house when we were in COVID because that was something I wanted to do and it gave me joy and it felt like I was making positive changes. Uh, but you know, there are things that you can do. Maybe it's learning uh, a new skill. Maybe it's um, being more creative with, uh, with your time, um, you know, doing a craft or uh, finding something that brings you joy. This is a difficult time. Um, we're missing teachers. Um, the teachers are such a support system to our students. They, they give them more than just lessons in math and English. They give them life lessons. And so when we're looking at not having those extra supports, um, it's very hard. And we often grieve what we're, we're missing out on. Um, the structure, the teachers, just being in a different setting often helps. Um, and it raises anxieties for us when we are not in our normal routine. You know, and, and Anne-Marie, I think when we were talking about the past and the future, 
you know, when we look at what was, you know, during the first part of this year and how it changed so much, all the changes came so quick. Yes. We were not prepared. We did not know. And when we're looking at the future right now, when we think about what's going to happen next, you know, at least we kind of know the things that we need to put into place. You know, once some students are going back to school, some are not, you know, and being able to practice the things to be able to help us for that future, to maybe be able to give us a little bit more time in the schools is to be able to wear our masks, to cough into our elbows, um, hygiene, washing your hands, not being um, so close to people. I think it helps us to know some of the things that we have to do in order to move in the future. Where in the past, um, at the beginning of this year, we didn't know all those things at first. So it's kind of frightening. So at least now, I think when we're looking into what's going to happen next, we have a little bit of an idea of some of the things that we might need to balance with that. I agree. I think that we, well, while we anticipate what comes next, even if we're in the schools, the, the students that have been able to go back into the schools, even that's changed. And so just navigating those new things, but also remembering how well that we did during you know, the major pandemic initially, and really giving ourselves credit for how well we did during that time and remembering some of the, the uh, coping skills that we used to help us. Um, I think that there's still a lot of anxiety out there, but we, need, we do need to remember what worked for us. And I, think, and I think we have to share, you know, when you're going back to school or you're not going back to school, share with the people that you live with, with um, trusting adults and your friends, some of the things that, you, that are causing you anxiety. You know, it is a whole different routine. And I know for a lot of the children that I've spoken to, and teens, um, as they're going back to school, it's the uncertainty of not knowing how school's going to be and how that's going to look. And I think, you know, once you step into that new, you know, that new routine, I think it's important to share it with people. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of things did you learn about yourself during this time? Sheila, what did you learn about yourself um, during the, pan the initial pandemic? Well, you know what I found is it was kind of nice just to kind of slow down the pace of everything. I enjoyed being at home. Um, I enjoyed being able to cook. And of course, I've gained 20 pounds, you know, because I had the cookies and the ice cream and all those kind of things. Um, but I also really realized that it's the simple things in life that really mean a lot to me. Um, being able to call and talk to the people that I love and the people I care about and the people that I've worked with. Um, I've missed them more than I thought that I would miss them. They were a big part of my life. And so I had to find new ways to be able to reach out and connect with them. And um, I would say it just really felt nice just to be able to just be. I realized that I love seeing the butterflies, the blue skies. I loved being out in my yard. Um, there were so many different things that um, I got to appreciate a lot more and that I really didn't have the time sometimes to do when our schedules are so busy. Isn't it amazing how it takes something like COVID to make us really stop and smell the roses um, to go outside? I know that initially a lot of people were afraid to go outside, um, but going out into your backyard and just breathing in the fresh air was was so invigorating. I felt so, um, you know, because we felt like we had to be closed in, but then be just being able to go outside, just even to the backyard and appreciating those simple things um, was so much nicer than running in my car and driving here and there and doing all the errands that I usually do in any given day. So having to slow down, I, I realized for myself was, was a gift. Um, you know, the COVID was a gift for me because I had to stay in my home and spend time with the people that I really love. Um, for some people that wasn't the case, but I'll bet they learned how to navigate through. I'll bet they figured out how to live with those people um, because you have to learn how to do that when you're stuck inside with people that maybe you don't necessarily get along with. So maybe they learned some new coping skills that way or learned how to uh, improve their relationships. 
And I think it's very important too to identify the people who support you in your life. And you know, for me, I even got closer to my siblings. You know that I mean, we haven't lived together for a long time, but it was really nice. It's almost daily that we've connected with each other, and so they're my support people. And um, I unfortunately broke my wrist during this COVID nineteen. And it was really neat how everybody just circled around me um, to support me. And then I had to learn how to do everything through social media and Zoom. And while that's a positive thing, at first, oh my gosh, I don't know if, if those of you out there, this is hard to navigate through. You know, you don't know which button to push. Sometimes your internet connection is not working. Um, today, I am a little darker in the screen and I'm like, what's going on? I'm in a very bright room. Um, but it's been, it, to me, I've loved it because it's really allowed me to connect with maybe some of the people that I might not have gotten to connect with. And I know through learning with my grandchildren, you know, at first it was very hard for them to navigate through um, the social media and the different things that they were going through to learn their uh, schoolwork. But as they've gotten to know it, um, it's, 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 it's something that you gain power over and you feel like you have a little bit of control over and stuff. So you're not so disconnected and stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found working with teenagers was, you know, they have all this social media out there and they used it during school time and they used it when um, they were supposed to be doing other things. But then when COVID hit, it was almost like they stopped using their social media. I think that it was so hard for them just to navigate all of the initial shutdown and changes that they stopped connecting with their friends and family. Um, and so I know that I encouraged my students to use their social media to connect and we would do like a, um, just like a group hangout once a week, just so that they could see each other but they really stopped using it. And I know I've learned and, and we at Companions on a Journey have done a lot of work on Zoom um, and learning how to, to uh, provide grief support services uh, via video, uh, which was quite an interesting challenge for us. So I'm wondering how many other people learned how to do that as well and maybe to connect with the loved ones that are close with them, um, you know, distance wise, and, and maybe see them more often. I know my family's in New Jersey, so I don't get to see them. But now because of Zoom, it's more of a habit. Uh, with, because of COVID, I've, I do Zoom with my family more often. So that, that has also been a very positive thing for me. But I'm wondering what kinds of things felt like they were in, their, in everyone's control at that point. I think that we felt like we were very out of control um, for a long time. And so I'm wondering what the, the locus of control was for people. What could they control in their lives that was positive? And if this happens again, what they will bring into that scenario next. So some of the things that I'm wondering about is things like, um, you know, are they going to do things differently in terms of structuring their day? Are they going to look at how they can take care of their mental health better? Do they know who their supports are and how to reach out to those people now um, and get what they need and to ask for what they need? You know, parents really want to help, but they don't always know when their kids are struggling. And so kids really need to start talking to their parents about what's going on for them and how, what they need and how their parent can help. And I know parents are always willing to help if they just know what it is they need to do. So I strongly recommend that we identify for ourselves now um, in the event that this happens again, what we need to be strong through, um, through this time, what worked for us before and what didn't work for us um, and what we're going to bring with us if it happens um, again. I know that there's a lot of talk about what will happen when flu season hits and, and that's a big concern for me in terms of worrying about kids becoming depressed and anxious again. 
Um, well, and you know, Anne-Marie, you bring up a good point too in sharing with your family. I know when I was a teenager, um, right around 15 years of age, I had two friends uh, that were killed in two separate car accidents and it was within the same month. And here I had transferred to a new school so nobody knew my grief or what I was carrying. And I was, I was really grieving. Um, but when I was a child, my father had almost died and my mom had a nervous breakdown. And she did all of her grief work. She went to counselors, she was better. But in my mind, you know, I had this fear of, is somebody else gonna die? What's gonna take place? Um, please, dear God, don't let somebody, you know, in my family die. And I couldn't wrap my brain around what I was feeling. You know, and I, and I couldn't say I am fearful, you know, and I didn't want to say that to my mom. And as I got older and I was able to share that with my mom, my mom said, why didn't you share that with me? And I think for children sometimes and teens, you know, you don't want to burden your loved ones, you know, that they've got a lot on their platter. But the one thing I want you to know is they love you. And they're there to support you. And if you can't share it with your parents, then find a trusting adult that you can share it with. You know, especially with going back to school, there are school counselors. Um, there's always people to be able to support you. But sometimes when you just sit down and think, okay, what's causing me to be anxious? And you could just write down whatever the situation was and maybe what triggered it. It might be able to give you then the words that you could share with someone else because I think it's very important for us not to wear a mask um, because this COVID-19 and grief can be pretty scary. And when you're going through the death of a parent or a sibling, and then you've got a pandemic that you're worried that somebody else might die, um, that's a lot to carry, you mm -hmm. know, just going back out into that world. So I would highly encourage you to be able to name it and claim it. And when you can name it and claim it, that's three fourths of the battle. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, you know, have that courage and pat yourself on the back when you do. Or if you're feeling anxious, just say, I'm not having a good day. You know, I don't know what's causing me, but let people around you know that you're having a little bit of a day. Well, and isn't that why we created uh, you know, mending, our Mending Hearts program? Is what we were finding was we had students who were grieving um, and weren't talking to their parents about, or their parents about what was going on. And then we had parents who were also grieving and weren't talking to their kids. And they were living in the same home and they were both feeling the weight of the grief and the sadness. Um, and neither one was talking to the other because they didn't want to upset each other. And I think some of that probably happened again with COVID, you know, you see that your parent is stressed out because of financial concerns or trying to figure out how to help you online with work or, you know, being um, just in the house, making sure that you have all the supplies. And so you feel like you don't want to burden your parent with your feelings. And then the parent is worried about everything and not wanting to upset their child. And so no one is talking about what's really going on. It's like the elephant in the room. Like we're just not, we're gonna pretend like we're all okay and no one is feeling sad and we're just getting through this. And what we have learned with Mending Hearts is that it's an opportunity for us to bring parents, families together to all sit around and talk, siblings to talk to each other and, um, and their parent about, this is really what I'm feeling and this is really hard for me and I really could use your help, but I don't want to burden you. And I think that that is something that goes on in grief uh, by death and grief by loss and change is that no one wants to burden anyone else because the weight feels so heavy. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what that weight might look like, Sheila, in terms of the feelings or the behaviors that people go through? Well, you know, I, I feel like sometimes we feel lost, confused. Um, we cannot focus. Um, sometimes you have anxiety. You feel like you can't breathe. You can't sleep. You can have stomach aches. You can have headaches. Um, and and that, that part is heavy. You're yearning for that loved one that you miss. You're yearning for the things that you miss. And um, for me, that heaviness of that fear that I had um, boy, it took me quite a while to navigate it through that, 
Mm -hmm. But I think that had I shared it with my mom and my dad, that this, this is what I'm feeling, I think I would have navigated through it a lot quicker. And a lot of times too, when we're going through feelings and emotions, you know, we feel like we're the only one that is carrying this, that there's nobody else that's going through it. And that's why we really talk about creating the balance using the slinky. You know, in life, we all want to try to be balanced. And we're as balanced as what we can. But I always tell people, if I was completely balanced, um, I probably would be very boring. You know, <laughs> and I think it's very important for us, you know, to when we're going through something to think, okay, what do I need to do? And I think you're going to find that your inner voice is going to say, you need to talk about it. You know, I wish somebody would just ask me what's going on. Well, sometimes somebody's not going to ask you, so you have to be bold and take control and allow yourself to break that barrier, to break that ice. Um, and it's surprising of, of the freedom that comes from that. But I think if you keep it up, you know, keep it bottled up, it almost becomes like concrete, you know, and then it, then it can become depression. Then you can withdraw. And I think it's very important for us to stay on top of it. So when you're first feeling something, name it, you know, reach out to somebody, talk to somebody. Our support groups that we have in high schools, um, our Mending Hearts for Grieving Children and Teens and Families is another way. Um, this year, we're gonna have a COJ Teen Connection, which we're really looking forward to being able to do that. And I encourage you to reach out to us because um, if you cannot navigate by sharing with someone, we can help to teach you and guide you to be able to have that voice because your voice is important and you're important to us as well. So Emory, talking about the healthy ways to cope, um, do you wanna go through those? Sure, so the first thing that I always say is get outside and breathe in some fresh air. No matter what time of year it is, just, you know, don't go out and put your feet in the snow. That's too cold. But, you know, if you want to go out and put your feet in some grass, that would be great. Um, but you can always go outside in the middle of winter and breathe in that fresh air. Uh, it's so important. You know, it really gets stuffy and, and almost feels claustrophobic when you're, you're in that house with too many people. Um, all day long and one other person could feel like too many people after a while so you know get out and just give yourself that break um, and I always think that establishing a routine I know on the weekends I'm not really good with staying on time I, I usually get up at 5 45 in the morning and I don't do that on Saturday and Sunday. And I find that my whole day kind of gets thrown off because my routine is off. Um, my sleep routine and my eating routine and then how I process through the day. Um, so I allow myself that uh, to just kind of have that time to just enjoy and not feel structured. But five days a week, Yes, it's important that we structure ourselves, that we, you know, if, if your routine is to not get up until one o'clock in the afternoon, that's fine if that works for you. But you also need to then figure out how to get everything in that you have to do. Um, you know, I was, um, I would get uh, text messages from my students at like um, 12 o'clock at night because they just, that was like the middle of their day, you know, so I had to kind of put some boundaries on that and say like, my schedule is not your schedule at this point. Um, so just understanding that your routine may not be someone else's routine as well. Um, and I think too, Emery, with the routine, <laughs> I always say this with grief, every day, get up, put yes. your two feet on the floor, Take a deep breath in, breathe in strength, breathe in grace, go into your bathroom and brush your teeth. Yeah. You know, and then take your shower. And I also tell everybody to make their bed. And I say that to them because structure, when we're going through grief and establishing new your routine that you need, the more that we have our normal structure, the more we have control. You know, and we've lost control, you know, when someone dies. We've lost control with this pandemic that we're going through. So we have to find that control. And, and when I said making the bed, I'm sure a lot of teenagers are like, oh my God, I'm not making my bed. Um, it's pulling your comforter up. And I just want to say that 27 years ago, I was widowed. And my routine is getting up, breathing in, brushing my teeth, taking my shower and making my bed. And there's studies that show that when you make your bed, um, at the end of the day, if your life has been out of control, 
when you're going to bed, you have something that has been prepared for you. And it feels so good to lay in something that is neat and just comforting. Um, it really feels good. So again, that routine is so, so important to have. Yes. And we need to know how this is affecting our bodies physically. Um, there is, there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score, which is an amazing book to read, and it, it's about trauma. But, and I think we all have been a little traumatized by COVID. But if we think about how this has affected our bodies, maybe not from having the virus, but just in um, the stress that we've dealt with. Um, you know, you, you, you really sometimes don't realize that your shoulders are up around your chin um, or that your stomach is just in knots or that your, your hands are clenched. So what I would say is to maybe every couple of hours, you know, put like a little reminder on your phone um, to just take a body scan. And it's very simple. So you just think about, you know, how's my head feeling? Um, how is my throat feeling? Um, you know, how is my chest? Is my chest feeling heavy? Are my shoulders feeling heavy? And then my hands, are my hands clenched or are they relaxed? Uh, my stomach, you know, just uh, my, you know, the tension overall in your body and to just kind of scan your body and to relax it. Um, I am amazed at how I go through a day and realize I have to relax my body and, and consciously do that. And I think in doing that, it gives us some clarity. It makes us feel better. It makes us able to move more easily throughout the day. So I would say that frequent body scans are so important. Um, you know, for I, I know that when I um, when I'm leaving my house in the morning, I'm always in a rush, no matter how much time I give myself. So before I go into work, I sit in my car and I just breathe and I just do a body scan to kind of get myself balanced again, because I want to be on my game when I walk into work. I want to be able to be there for people. And if I am all stressed out and tense before I even want to walk in the door, I'm not going to be good for anybody. So I have to take care of me and put my oxygen mask on and then be able to take care of everyone else. It's kind of like when you're on that plane and they tell you to use the, put your oxygen mask on first. Um, so that's one of the things that I would say is a, a great coping skill. It's not hard to do. It takes 30 seconds and then to just breathe, um, to take some breaths in and just relax your body and get yourself in a good place. If you're having a hard time, if you're having a strong emotion, breathe it in, feel it, and allow it to flow through you. In doing that, um, you then allow yourself to experience the emotion, but then you're able to also let it go. If you're not doing that, what happens is that you kind of push it down and pushing it down and it just keeps building up until you explode or you, you know, get yourself to a point where it's so hard to think straight um, or your anxiety levels are higher. So one of the things that I would say is to kind of take care of your body, take care of your mind, know what you're feeling. Um, and know how it's affecting you in doing that, you can then be more productive for yourself. And in, even with the body scan, sometimes they take, take your body temperature. Mm -hmm. So when you were saying anxiety, Anne-Marie, I think all of us, and maybe if you haven't noticed this, um, maybe be more um, aware of this. You know, when you feel yourself starting to get anxious or starting to get mad, or things that have upset you that all of a sudden you're starting to feel things, start to remember those things and be able then to think, wait a minute, my temperature is raising right now. What do I need to do within my body, within my control to be able to bring myself down or be able to calm myself right now? And it might be stepping outside, you know, and um, again, letting people know that, you know, I, I, I need a break right now. Mm -hmm. It's very important, but I think taking that um, emotional temperature is very important too. And just to be aware of what are the situations and the things that are causing that emotional temperature to rise. Absolutely. Um, 
I know that there are other things that are helpful to people. Like um, I know when I have a crazy day, the one thing that I want to do is write it all down. And I, I, if I write it all down, it, it simplifies it for me. So if I have a lot of different things to do, I make a list of what it is, maybe put some time frames on it um, to kind of give myself some structure. Uh, that's always helpful to me. The other thing is that if, you, if you're having trouble sleeping, because there's just too much going on in your head. One of the things that I would strongly recommend is to have a notebook and a piece of paper next to you. Wake up, get yourself out of bed, write down just words, doesn't have to be full sentences, it doesn't even have to make sense, uh, but get it out of your head. And if you write it down, it's almost like you've given yourself permission to let go of it. And then you can get back in bed and try to go back to sleep. I know that if you just lay there for hours, it's not helpful and not productive for you to get what you need in terms of your sleep. So I always tell people to take, you know, just to, to put it somewhere else, get it out of your head and put it somewhere else. And it seems to help. Um, so really having a journal. Yep. You know, and keeping Absolutely. it near your bed is really good because I think those journals not only help you to get things out of your head, but, you know, if there's quotes or there's songs or there's people that you meet or things that bring you up, jot those down, you know, yes. and, and if you're missing um, your loved one or your friends, jot a little note, write it in that, in that book. You know, it just really, truly helps. I love that idea, Anne-Marie. Yes. Um, you know, even at night when you're preparing, you, you talked about how per, you prepare this nice place for you to go to sleep. You know, sleep is so important to the way we um, go through the next day. You know, when we're tired and frustrated, uh, we, we, we tend to feel things harder. We tend to maybe not be as patient with ourselves or other people, maybe have some anxiety or sadness because we just, we just don't feel right. Um, so preparing that evening uh, ritual for you is such a great thing. You know, maybe some aromatherapy, um, some soft lighting, something to kind of help you relax at the end of a busy day so that you can fall asleep and you know, get a good night's sleep so that you are refreshed for the next day. And that really leads you into the locus of control. So how do you control the things in your life that may be difficult to identify what you do have control over? So um, some of the things you have control over is when you wake up and when you choose to go to sleep, um, who you choose to, to engage with every day, right? Who you choose to contact friends or family, or maybe not talk to them if, if they are stressing you out. Um, you know, looking at who, who in your life is your support and helpful to you and what in your life is helpful to you as well. So, you know, eating healthy always is a great thing. Um, you know, maybe saying today I'm gonna do math and tomorrow I'll do the English. I, I don't, I just can't focus on the math today. You have control over some of those things. So take the opportunity to take some of those controls and use them to your benefit. I think the more we feel like we're in control in a situation that's out of control, the better the better we are ever able to navigate the world. Um, the, the other thing that I always tell people is to do some mind, mindfulness, like we had just talked about, you know, just taking those breaths in and just relaxing your body and allow yourself to just be present. I find that when people are very stressed out, it's usually because of something that happened previously or something that's going to happen. And when we are very stressed out, the best thing we can do is just take that moment to focus on right here, right now, for this moment. And if you can do that, if you can take that breath in and know that you're safe and know that where you are right now is where you need to be, and just relax your body, it gives you the energy, I think, to move on to the next step. But usually what's going on for people is they're stressed about, out about what's happening in the future. So when you need to, just stop. Stop thinking about the future. And mindfulness is not about not thinking at all. 
people think that it's meditation and it's you know clearing your head and while that's really great as human beings it's hard for us to clear our heads so we have to be realistic in just being present and doing that quick body scan and just relaxing our bodies and taking that breath in for us so that we can move forward to do what we need to do next. Well, and I think when we think of the mindfulness, Anne-Marie, you know, a lot of times we'll talk when we're leading support groups is being coming present to the present moment. Yes. You now we can, you can look in a rear view mirror and think of all the things that you're missing. Mm -hmm. And then you can look forward and think, oh my gosh, all these things are going on. And when you become present to this present moment, and you take that time to breathe, and you take the time to look at the things that are surrounding you. It might be, you know, sometimes I'll tell um, our students to just listen to what they hear. You know, what are they smelling? What are they feeling? You know, and by doing those things, it allows us to reset our body. Reset our body so that we can calm ourselves down. And I think that's so important to do. You know, and, and when we're coming into where we share those people, places, and things, you know, I've had a lot of people that we've worked with in creating their journals. When they're meeting new people and people that bring them up and give them strength, I tell them to get that person's name and number and keep that person's, you know, name and number in their book. And as they become better friends with them, you know, they've got that so that they're, if they're in that moment where, you know, they're just not sure or they're having a difficult time, they know they can turn to those people. So I think it's important to be able to do that. And it's bringing us back into that present moment. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about holding your heart? I sure would. I love this. <laughs> um, two ways that we can become present to the present moment. And, and if you're out there and you're able to, and you're not driving, um, I would like for you to just put your two hands over your heart. And I want you to hold your heart. And I want you to remember this, that you hold your heart. You have to take care of you, you know? And, and when we take care of us and we put ourselves first when we need to, um, it really is it's so gratifying and so fulfilling. But I want you to put your two hands over your heart. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to take a deep breath in. Breathe in for four. Hold for seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Blow out for eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now breathe in again. And exhale. Breathe in again and just breathe in God's grace. Exhale. I want you to breathe in love. And exhale. And open your eyes. I don't know what you felt, but love is not something that we see. Love is something that we feel. And we, when we allow ourselves to be present to that present moment, we can be connected to ourselves, we can be connected to our loved ones here, and we can be connected to our loved ones, you know, in heaven or where you feel that they are. Um, there's an invisible string of love that nothing can separate us from that. And I think it's very important. And when I do that breathing, I don't know about you, but after I inhale and I breathe in grace or you could breathe in strength, you know, whatever, whatever works for you, um, and then I breathe in love, I almost feel like my whole chest expands and I'm like, oh my goodness. And I only wish I could do this at nighttime and fall asleep. I do perfect when I'm guiding this with everyone, but um, it's incredible, you know? And I know for me, I've worked with many, many families, you know, who've had loved ones die. And when we think about that invisible string of love, when you think about your loved ones who are here that might live in a different house or a different state, you're still connected to them. And I truly feel that when we've had a loved one die, um, I know I'm still connected to my husband and to my mom and my dad and sister. I just know I am. Too many things come about that I feel them, but being come present to the present moment, I think is so, so important. And that breathing, that four, seven, and eight, that is a great breathing exercise, you know? So, 
you know, just remember, and I would say when you're doing the four, seven, eight, you know, when you're breathing in for four and you're holding for seven and you blow out for eight, you know, do that about eight to 10 times um, because that really is a great way to reset your body and your mind and your spirit. And that times in our lives, especially right now, we need to be able to reset our body, minds, and spirit. And I think that breathing experiences, um, I really never realized that I had all that within me. You know, it's a natural medicine, you know? And another thing that I'd like to say, ways to feel calm, it's, it's important when we feel like we need to cry, we should cry. When we feel like we need to laugh, we need to laugh. When we feel like we need to go for a run, go for a run. Because all those things create endorphins. And those endorphins are like natural medicines. And when we allow them to flow, it takes place and it resets us. So many things when we're going through things in life that might be overwhelming or you feel like you're going to cry, if you cry, sometimes it only lasts for 90 seconds. But if you allow it to flow, it kind of flushes you and it kind of fills you, you know? So um, I, I highly recommend those things. Um, they've worked so, much, so well for myself and for all the children and adults that I work with. So I'm wondering if there are any questions out there um, that people might have about grief and loss uh, during this time. And they could put that into their chat. Mm -hmm. Maybe you all, maybe you all answered all those questions with that great presentation. Um, I know for one, I have a new post-it note that I'm putting on my computer that says breathe four, seven, eight. So I remember to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Really powerful and it really does make a difference. It truly does. And you know, another thing that I tell people to do is every day they should look in the mirror and you should say, you are incredible. You look at yourself, you speak to yourself as your best friend, you know, and you go, wow, you are incredible. Do you know how amazing you are? Do you know how beautiful you are? I love you. You know, and I think when we do that, and at times kids are going, oh my gosh, I'm not going to do that. So <laughs> bring years into groups and stuff. But when we're doing that and they start to do it, people are going, oh, I don't know if I can say that to myself. And I go, but do you really realize how beautiful you are? I mean, we're so unique. We're so unique that there's only one of us, one of us, you know? And so everybody has different talents. Everybody has different gifts, you know? And um, even for people that are not able to do things, you know, I mean, breaking my arm, I found that I'm kind of restricted but I can do a lot of praying. I can pick up the phone and talk to people. I can navigate one hand on the computer. But when I look at myself, I think, wow, you are amazing, you know? And I want everybody to do that because you are amazing and you're the only one that has ever been created. And um, you're a special gift to your family, to the world and um, to all of us. And I'm honored and privileged to be able to be with all of you tonight. Absolutely. And the one thing that I would add to that is to give yourself grace. You know, why don't we be as gentle with ourselves as we would with our best friend or someone that we love so very much? I think we give ourselves such a hard time and we judge ourselves so hard. And we would never judge anyone as hard as we judge ourselves. So give yourself grace. You know, we're all going through something um, and you often going through something too. So allow yourself to just, um, you know, feel good about who you are and where you are and what you're trying to accomplish. And you know, one thing that helps me, my mom, I've had my mother die, my sister die, my father, my husband. And when I miss them the most for my mother and my father, half of me is my father, half of me is my mother. I believe my sister is still a part of me. I allowed Vince's love to be in my heart. When I miss them the most, I give myself a hug and oh, you know, it feels so good. And especially during this pandemic, you know, when we're missing all the people and missing the hugs that we would normally get or the high fives, sometimes we have to do the air high five now, but give yourself a hug. And, um, oh my gosh, it feels so good. 
You know, it's things that we have to learn and get comfortable with. Um, and I wish I could give you all a hug right now. Some of you would say, I don't want a hug, but anyway, I'll give you a high five. But um, <laughs> you know, I think it's just, just enjoy today, you know? You know, we have one moment at a time, one step at a time, one breath at a time. And when we take it that way, we can, we can handle almost anything. Wow, you sure make this pandemic seem like easy street <laughs> after talking to you two. Really, um, lots of really wonderful um, pieces of advice and tips and tricks that um, I think a lot of people can relate to. And I'm, I know others like me are excited to practice some of those things. So I just wanted to say thank you very much to Sheila and um, Marianne for, uh, or Anne-Marie, um, excuse me, Sheila and um, Anne-Marie for taking the time to talk with us tonight. Um, Companions on a Journey is their, um, is their uh, organization. Check it out on Facebook and on the internet. Um, and just thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you for having us. Um, One in Five is an incredible organization. Yes. And I always say to Nancy, um, out of our pain has come our purpose and passion. And yes. thank you for continuing the passion of life and giving to others. It's a special gift. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks. A special thank you to our State of Mind speakers and to you for joining us. More videos and educational resources can be found at One in Five's website. If you feel like you or your child is in need of professional support, therapists are available. Please refer to Mind Pieces school-based or community resource page. For a mental health crisis or emergencies, patients and families are encouraged to contact their current mental health provider first. This allows the mental health provider who knows your child best to provide support and direction. If your child does not have a mental health provider and they are experiencing a non-life-threatening mental health crisis, you are encouraged to contact the Psychiatric Intake Response Center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. 513-636-4124. Call 911 or go to the emergency department if you are experiencing a medical emergency, a life-threatening mental health crisis, or are directed to go there by a medical provider. This will help limit the spread of COVID-19 in our community and allow our emergency departments to care for patients with the most critical needs first.